any, have I got anything here? I don't think, there, is that getting better? Well, I'm a bit of a stranger, but I am back here. And I do still live in town, so don't, don't be worried. And uh, good to be here today, and uh, good to see uh, Herman and Judy back again from way across the sea. And we hear that uh, there are some good things happening with the family and some bad things happening with the family. So uh, we uh, hope and pray that all will go well there way over in Taiwan. And uh, just uh, a word, Lorraine would just like to remind you there's still places in the CHIP program that's coming up and uh, there's advertising material out there on the table and uh, she'd like you to make sure that uh, no opportunity is missed to uh, distribute those uh, invitation uh, programs to the CHIP information programs. And uh, there's three times there. Some people are ringing up as a result of the ads in the paper. Uh, but you will have friends and uh, relations and acquaintances that you might be able to help. And if they can come along to the information program, that's a good starter for them. They get informed as to how the program runs and they're much more likely to join in and benefit from what CHIP can do for them. So uh, please be aware of that. Lorraine's uh, away today. She decided to go out to the camp and has taken uh, someone who has been attending here, I think, uh, with her, with a girl, out to the camp. So that'll be a new experience for them, perhaps. <clears throat> I don't always give a title to the sermon, but uh, for those of you who take away the title rather than the sermon, the sermon title is Service with a Smile. This thing rocks around something horrible here. I wonder if we've got corner of a handkerchief it would stop it bumping and you won't hear it through there I'd like you to take your Bible to uh, Luke chapter 10 Luke chapter 10 and there we read the account of a very familiar story it uh, was familiar even in Jesus day the essence of the story the, the basis of it because uh, this records a actual event apparently that was the talking, the conversation piece of the people at that particular time. You know how stories get around town and everyone's talking about it? Well, this story seemed to be around town. And Jesus saw in this story and this experience an opportunity to teach some very vital lessons. And uh, so we're in Luke chapter 10 and reading from verse 25. And we read, and uh, I might do some little diversions here, so it'll be the KJC version, not the KJV necessarily. So don't get alarmed at that. You read whatever you've got there. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So here's this fellow testing Jesus to see whether Jesus knows his stuff about eternal life. And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? How do you understand it? And the young lawyer says to him, you shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. This do, and you will live. Jesus wasn't suggesting that we are saved by works. He wasn't suggesting that at all. What Jesus was doing was talking to a lawyer who is analytical in the way he thinks and who is knowledgeable in the Old Testament scriptures and in the history of God's dealing with his people and he is reminding him in a subtle way but to him, the lawyer, but probably not so subtle, that the original requirements for eternal life was to obey God's commandments, the commandments that pertain to God and those that pertain to man, the commandments <coughs> that tell us how to live, how to live before God and how to live before our fellow men. That's what he was saying. 
Jesus was affirming what this young fellow said, and I presume he's a young lawyer, because young lawyers are usually the ones that are trying these tricks. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind and thy neighbour as thyself. Part, in the, part of it uh, there recorded in the Levitical law, Leviticus 19, isn't it? And Jesus said, that's right. But the lawyer's next question in his mind would be, but none of us do it. None of us achieve it. So there must be something else I can do in order to have eternal life. <clears throat> but he, the lawyer, willing to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbour? If I have to love my neighbour as myself, I better know who my neighbour is. Now, neighbours are a bit hard to define, aren't they? Sometimes you live in a street and you consider one person on one side of you a neighbour and the one on the other side of you a neighbour, but the one behind you, that way I suppose it is, um, the one behind you, you don't really want to call them a neighbour because lined up against uh, the fence, uh, your back fence, behind your back fence, are all the variety of, uh, <coughs> of bottles that you don't like on your side of the fence. There are cans there that you don't like the design of at all, all scattered around everywhere. There are several old cars that have been there for 10 years or more, always going to be fixed up but never do. And uh, <coughs> there's boxes and, and uh, junk and rubbish everywhere, besides the various types of dogs, several of which you don't like at all, and you're not a... You're not a keen to jump over the fence and rescue the kid's ball because of the kind of animals that are on the other side of the fence there. And you think to yourself, this person is not my neighbour. <clears throat> but you can't help it. He's there. We lived in a situation like that. We had a lovely neighbour on one side and a lovely neighbour on the other side and we had the mongrel mob at the back. And what the mongrel mob accumulated... And where they got it from, I've no idea. Um, the police were rather interested in discovering some of the things that were in that backyard there. But after some while, the mongrel mob guys used to lean over the fence and talk to me while I dug the garden. And after a while, their kids used to come through a hole in the fence, which, uh, well, it was a hole. I blocked it up so that the dogs wouldn't come through. And the kids used to come over and play with our kids. And I discovered that some of these fellows were actually quite neighbourly. One of them even offered to come over and help me shift something without ever being asked. And I thought, well, maybe mongrel mobs are not all mongrels after all. Well, anyway, one day we just got back from church and the police were all around the uh, entrance to our house and uh, in the side street. And uh, they stopped us and they said, oh, we just about finished an operation here. And... Uh, <coughs> There was a bit of a mess on the footpath right outside of our house and it turns out that the mongrel mob had run foul of the black power and they'd had a shootout outside of our house while we were at church. So, uh, which was a shame, really. It would have been interesting to see what happened there, actually. But uh, they had a shootout there and uh, one fellow was pretty seriously injured. Um, the others got off with uh, minor injuries and, of course, they all ended up in the police wagon and uh, at least many of them did. And uh, so sometimes you do wonder who your neighbour is. And Jesus took the opportunity of answering a question about the neighbour. Verse 30, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. You ever seen a half-dead person? Who's seen a half-dead person? Be careful because I'm going to ask you the next question. <laughs> How do you know they're half-dead? <laughs> when do you know? Well, I asked a, a doctor, very experienced doctor. He's uh, actually an oncologist. And I, I said to him, How do you know um, when a person's half-dead? We were talking about this story. I said, How do you know when a person's half-dead? And he said, Well, it's pretty hard to tell, he says. Sometimes he says, you think this person's on the way out. They're half dead, all right. They'll, they'll be gone in another hour or so. And he said, you come back in an hour and they've revived no end. And he says, they're ready to go again next day. And so you're not too sure. And others, he said, you think they've got another week or two to go and you come back next morning to the, uh, 
to the hospital or to the clinic or whatever, and they've gone. He says, it's a bit hard to measure when someone is half dead, but I'm going to tell you when someone's half dead in a few minutes, <clears throat> how you'll know that someone's half dead. He left him half dead, and by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. I don't know how wide the road is, but this is the road that was called the Valley of the Shadow of Death. King David talked about it, wrote about it in his psalm, didn't he? The Valley of the Shadow of Death. A narrow road, probably, not too wide, but perhaps just wider at certain spots where people could pass with their donkeys or their little carts or their chariot if they happened to be a military man. So here and there it was a little bit wider. And I'm just presuming that maybe this man was lying on the side of the road and uh, he was uh, at one of those wider spots. Because here comes the priest and uh, he looks at this man apparently a corpse, and he goes past on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, he came and looked on him, and he passed by on the other side as well. Don't we consider these to be miserable characters? We rather like this story, don't we? Because we have a couple of miserable characters who come from the hierarchy of the church, and they do the wrong thing. And uh, this appeals to some people. I think, well, there you are. There's the hierarchy. They're not so smart after all. And then, of course, we know that the Samaritan came along and went across the road and helped this man who'd been attacked by bandits. And uh, you see, the, the priest was someone who would be expected to offer this stricken man something that we might call the last rites. Even if he thought he was half dead and he was not going to live for much longer, he would be expected to offer him some spiritual comfort, some sort of comfort. He would surely be able to tell him to look forward to something for the future, even if death should take him, that he should be able to look forward to an eternity somewhere. And uh, surely he should be able to give him some spiritual uplift. We would expect it of him, wouldn't we? That's what one would expect of someone who is a spiritual leader in the community. And this man fails in his responsibility and his duty. He doesn't want to be identified as a priest. And he passes by on the other side. It's inconvenient for him. It could be uh, <coughs> upsetting to his program would not just delay him for that moment or two or hour or two, it might delay him when he gets to where he is going, perhaps as a religious ceremony to conduct, and he wouldn't be able to do it because he'd be unclean. For if the man died in his hands and he had to handle a corpse, he would be unclean and would have to go through a certain cleansing ritual before he could function in the synagogue or wherever it was at Jericho. And we don't know whether he was going to Jerusalem or whether he was going to Jericho. We don't know which way the priest was going. And uh, the Levite, he was the Dorcas leader of the Jewish community. The Levite was to be someone that we would call today a deacon or a deaconess, if it was a Levitess, I suppose. And uh, they were the ones who were supposed to do the welfare work and uh, the care of the things around the temple and uh, the synagogue and to care for the distribution of arms. That's the gifts that people gave for the well-being and welfare of the community. And so here is the Levite and he looks on him too and he goes across to the other side. We don't know which way these people are going either. This man is going either. I'm going to suggest to you that maybe they're going in the opposite direction. Maybe they are heading from Jericho to Jerusalem rather than Jerusalem to Jericho. And I suggest that uh, for a reason which uh, I may be able to answer a little later on. <coughs> and uh, he passes by on the other side. We expect him to do his duty. We expect it's his responsibility if he takes the title of Levite that he's going to step over to this man and help him in a physical way. He's going to bind up his wounds, maybe put a splint on his leg or put something on his head. Offer him something to soothe the pain and to relieve some of the suffering and perhaps even carry him to somewhere where there is shade. That's his job 
as a Levite, but he fails in his duty. Verse 33 says, A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Now the Samaritans were hated by the Jews. You probably know that well enough. The Samaritans were cousins of the Jews, and uh, they did things a little different. They had chosen to worship in a different place than Jerusalem. They had set their own system of worship up, which was a terrible crime in the sight of the Jews. And they even had little icons around in the church, little uh, images and things around in the church, in the synagogue, and in their temple at uh, Jerusalem. And uh, they uh, said that these were aids to worship. They help us to worship. We focus our mind on uh, Isaiah or on Jeremiah or on the little uh, figurine of, of Moses. And it helps us to think about these great uh, sages of uh, previous ages. And we think about what they did and it helps us to worship God. And the Jews said they were idolaters and they were idol worshippers. And the Jews hated them. And when the Samaritan came down the road, he saw where he was and he had compassion on the man. And he went over to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and he set him on his own beast and he brought him to an inn and took care of him. This story must have started to become a little painful to the lawyer whom Jesus was addressing a question, an answer to a question to. And uh, the Samaritan, the Samaritan actually came to him. The picture is that the Samaritan is coming along on the other side of the road and sees the man over there and he actually comes over to investigate to see what he can do for the half-dead man. He has a heart of compassion. He knows that this is a dangerous road. He knows that this road is a road that has to be taken if one wants to go between Jerusalem and Jericho or Jericho and Jerusalem. There are no alternatives. You have to take that route. And he knows that there are bandits hiding behind the rocks and the thorn bushes and the odd shrub that is there, hiding in the ravines and the gullies, and they make their living by robbing those who look a little wealthy and a little better off and uh, leaving them half dead or at times even dead. And his heart goes out to him because he realises that he too has walked this path before. And he knows that it's a dangerous road. So he bound him up, bound up his wounds, poured in the oil and the wine that uh, he, the Samaritan, had taken for his own comfort because he knew that uh, he would suffer some injuries on this track, some bruises, some bumps, some slips on the loose gravel on the, the corners of the tracks <laughs> and so on. And I will remember this as kids we used to have to go over the road, we used to call it. Over the road meant going up through the farmer's paddock. Neighbour's paddock, it meant crossing the, the river at low tide, walking across the mud flat, which would have been about from here to Mitre 10 across the road there. The mud flats and the rushes and those rushes, the cows used to graze them off and they came up all bristly. And for kids, they were just about uh, halfway up your shins, about that high, and these bristly rushes would prick your legs. And uh, our legs would get pretty sore walking through these rushes. Walk through the neighbor's paddock. Sometimes it was the bull paddock. And uh, over the other side of the, uh, the hill, uh, about a mile away, uh, was over the road. Over to the road, we should have said, but that's the road and uh, that's where the delivery van from the local grocery which grocery shop, which was a good few miles away from us, uh, used to drop his stuff in the little old cream stands. Remember those little old cream stands they used to have where you put your cream cans on this little platform with a little cover over it? Well, uh, <coughs> that's where they used to occasionally drop bread and other parcels, and we kids used to have to go over the road and uh, <coughs> get... Um, the groceries and we'd take with us a sugar bag which we'd make into a backpack. You know how to make a backpack out of a sugar bag? I'll have to show the kids how to make a backpack one day, won't I? Backpack out of a sugar bag and we'd take a sugar bag backpack each and we'd go over the road with an empty backpack and come back with it full of groceries and stuff 
and uh, with a loaf of bread in our hand, ripping off the crust off the loaf of bread and eating it as we came back, and uh, we blamed all sorts of things for the injury to the bread, but uh, mum never swallowed that. We swallowed the bread. And, but we'd get back with our wounds. Sometimes we had to uh, deviate because the bulls were in the paddock. Not that they were such bad bulls, but we were pretty wary. So we'd deviate and walk through the fern patch. And we'd get scratches and cuts. And uh, mum used to have a mixture made up of uh, Vaseline and cod liver oil, I think it was. Um, uh, a messy sort of a mixture. And said, oh, rub this on your leg. So we'd rub this... Uh, I think it was Vaseline, cod liver oil, smelt terrible and she rubbed it on our legs and the next day we'd be right as rain again. And uh, so that's, uh, <coughs> that's our uh, little story about how uh, I understand this story. This man did all that was necessary to bring comfort and restoration to this injured man. <coughs> he took him on his own beast. By his own means of transport, he brought him to an inn and he took care of him there. We don't know how long he stayed uh, there, but obviously for the night. And uh, the next day when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host. And he said to him, take care of him and whatever you spend more, when I come back again this way, I will repay you. You see, the good Samaritan expected to be back again. He expected to see this man again. He expected he would be back and he determined that he wouldn't leave the job half done. He would see it through and make sure that all that should be done and all that should be paid is paid. Now Jesus asked the question, which now of these three do you think was neighbor to him that fell amongst the thieves? And the lawyer says to him, he that showed mercy on him. And Jesus said to him, Go and do thou likewise. What did Jesus mean when he said, Go and do thou likewise? Does he tell us that we should be going out looking for people who are wounded and injured and who need the special care of a medical professional? Was he telling us <coughs> that we have to go out and take a road that everyone has to travel if they want to go from A to B and spend our life traversing that road up and down and up and down in case we might meet somebody who has been injured along the way? I don't think that's really what Jesus was saying. I think what Jesus was saying is <coughs> that you must take the same attitude as the Good Samaritan. You must take that attitude and you may well come across those who have need. As I've looked at this story and as I've heard it preached on, on many occasions in my younger years and having preached on it previously as well, um, not understanding its full extent, I must say, I have discovered some rather significant things that apply to the practical uh, as far as this story is concerned. I want to go quickly through these, but then I'll tell you something far more important afterwards. <clears throat> Number one, we should sort out and define who our neighbour is. You ought to know who your neighbour is. Is your neighbour just someone who lives next door to you, or is your neighbour a relative or a friend or an acquaintance or is your neighbour anyone who comes across your path that you can have some influence on for good? I believe that's where our neighbour is. Our neighbour is anyone who comes across our path that we have opportunity to help for good. Number two, <clears throat> we need to recognise there are needs in society and persons in trouble and we need to be prepared to offer assistance uh, where we can. We have to recognise it. Don't ignore the fact there's a lot of problems out there. <clears throat> we need to develop a godly compassion and a sympathy for people because you can help people in a very cold and clinical way which is of little help at all. Recently they uh, conducted a study of uh, 46,000 patients in uh, English hospitals and the study was to determine whether patients who were shown sympathy and compassion 
because they have friends, relatives who sympathise with them, show them compassion, uh, whether they recover better than people who have no friends and are shown no sympathy and compassion. You know the answer to that, don't you? They discovered, quite right, I'm sure, uh, as you've come to that conclusion, those who have friends and offer compassion, those who show care for, for those who are injured and ill, uh, uh, those who are showed, shown care, um, who are injured and ill, they recovered much more quickly and remained well much longer than the others who were not given any particular uh, care. Godly compassion. Be prepared to have some tools to work with. The Good Samaritan has uh, the emergency kit of the day, oil and wine. Maybe oil and wine um, has some particular um, symbolic meaning in this passage as well. Uh, we might look at that in a minute. Put aside cultural and ethnic distinctions. Cultural and ethnic distinctions prevent a lot of people from doing what could be done. Is it politically correct to do this? Is it politically correct to say that? We've got into a world where political correctness has gone mad, haven't we? Absolutely crazy. We need to put aside that kind of thing. When people are in need, their blood is the same. And under the skin, they have exactly the same flesh. Be prepared to suffer discomfort and inconvenience if necessary. Service is not always comfortable. Some people spend their life giving service to others. Recently, I saw uh, an item where a lady had spent 46 years since the inauguration, I think, of St John Ambulance in New Zealand uh, with St John Ambulance. Another lady in Australia had spent uh, 27 years with uh, um, Coast Watch. What do they call it? Uh, um, whatever they call it in Australia. It's got a slightly different name than here. Uh, ever since it started, and, and she was commended and given some sort of medal for a service to it, 27 years. And uh, they said that they, they did it uh, because they uh, felt it was something that they could do which uh, they were not qualified to do in any other way. And uh, when they talked about the discomforts of giving that kind of service, they admitted it was often uncomfortable. <clears throat> Put some money into it. Invest in it. We need to invest in what we do to help others. And unless we're prepared to invest in it, we will only work in a pretty clinical way. We won't achieve very great results. Anything that's worth doing is worth investing some dollars and cents in, and time, which for many people is dollars and cents. <coughs> Invest in it. Not much is achieved today without financial investment. <coughs> Follow the program up and see it through. And don't leave it half done. The Good Samaritan saw the program through. He even planned to come back and to care for whatever costs, whatever else he could do, he would do to make sure it works. Well, there's some of the practical applications that I've heard down through the years, and I guess there are others that I've forgotten. But I think maybe Jesus was going to a greater depth than just this. After all, the priest perhaps had done many good deeds in his day and maybe, of course, the Levite also had done a lot of good in his time. And maybe because this was a terrifying situation to be in that uh, their nerve just gave out and uh, away they went to get out of the road. You know, you sometimes see signs up and it says, do not stop in this location. Uh, the last time I saw it, I think I was walking up to the uh, glaciers at Fox Glacier and there's big signs up, do not stop in these locations, keep walking. And I wondered why they put these signs up the first time I went there and I soon found out because the rocks were falling out of the cliffs and uh, these stones were falling out, frost causes it apparently and then they dry out or whatever and, the, and they fall out and crash down. And of course if you stand there, the risk of getting hit on the head by a rock is much greater than if you keep moving. 
And uh, then I uh, drove through a tunnel somewhere in uh, a very rough, rugged tunnel in Norway. And it had a notice up in English and Norwegian. Fortunately, I could read the English notice. And it says, do not stop in this tunnel. Uh, falling rocks may damage your car. They didn't say it might damage my head, but it might damage my car. So uh, it wasn't my car, it was a rental car, but I didn't stop. I kept moving and I could see every now and then there was a rock on the road. And uh, well, I suppose they were still working on the tunnel, I don't know. <coughs> Maybe the fear of one's life uh, <coughs> could excuse uh, these men a little bit. But I want to suggest to you today that Jesus is talking about a different kind of a journey. He's talking to a lawyer. He's talking to someone who's going to analyse this thing. And he's going to think about why did Jesus tell me such a story? And I want to suggest to you that uh, we are all on a journey. And our journey has started by going from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now you know about Jericho, don't you? Jericho was the city that God condemned and destroyed. And we are all on that journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. We should be going from Jericho to Jerusalem, shouldn't we? We are going the wrong way. And this man is going the wrong way. He's turned his back on Jerusalem and he's going to Jericho. And Jesus, I believe, stands in for the Good Samaritan. Jesus is walking the road. He is looking for people who have become entangled with the bandit, the great bandit who lurks behind everything that he can to distract us and to catch us and to destroy us. And Jesus wants to reverse the journey and take us to somewhere a lot safer than Jericho. He wants to take us from Jericho to Jerusalem and he takes us on that journey and he finds us though wounded and damaged and irrecoverable and a priest or a Levite or anyone else in human garb and human nature is unable to restore you and I, so that we are fit citizens to enter Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem. Only Jesus, the good Samaritan par excellence, is able to repair us, to heal the wounds that Satan has inflicted upon us. And only he is able to put us in a fit state to enjoy the glories and the peace and the security of the new Jerusalem. I think this young lawyer might have understood what Jesus was really talking about. See, Jesus says, go and do thou likewise. Accept the help of the good Samaritan. You see, Jesus said there were three people in this party. There was the priest, there was the Levite, and there was the lawyer. The good Samaritan stands out on his own as being different from all three. And the good Samaritan, I believe, represents Jesus. We need to accept what Jesus offers to us. Otherwise, we'll never make the journey through the valley of the shadow of death. The valley of the shadow of death will be real to us. It will become the valley of death, the valley of eternal death. We must accept the medical aid that Jesus gives to us. Jesus came to this world to save sinners, Paul says, of whom I am chief. And I align myself with Paul and I say, Paul, I agree with you. Um, you and I are the worst of sinners. Paul sinned in a different way than I sinned, perhaps, but I am as bad as the worst of sinners. I have the potential to be as bad as any bad person that you can imagine. And you have the potential to be as evil and as bad as anyone that you can think of uh, as being the most evil and terrible person who's ever lived. The potential is there. 
But thanks to the grace of God, he lifts us out of that and reduces the risk. And he goes with us and takes us by the transportation of his own self and through the power of the Holy Spirit, transforms us and makes us into people who are restored, people who are renewed, people who are revitalized, people who are fit to take into the city of Jerusalem. I trust today that you will put your confidence in Jesus, our Saviour, the one who alone can take us through. In closing, I'll refer you to the book of Ephesians, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, and uh, chapter 2, I think it is. Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 2. <coughs> and uh, here Paul is talking to the Ephesians, and he says to them, And you he has brought to life who were dead in your trespasses and sins. You see, you were on that road of the valley of the shadow of death. You were going the wrong direction. You were going to into trouble and to death. But you, he, that is Jesus, has brought to life who were dead in trespasses and sins. The old-fashioned English word quickened means to bring to life. Where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that's the, of, uh, of Satan himself, and the spirit that now works in the children of disobedience. That's where we all were once, among whom also we all had our conversation, our behavior, in times past in the lusts of our flesh and fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature the children of wrath even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are ye saved. And hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us, through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, in case any man should boast. The lawyer wanted to know what he could do to have eternal life. What Jesus is saying is, you need to submit to me. You need to submit to me and I can ensure that you have eternal life. My invitation to you today is that you submit to Jesus Christ and be assured that your journey will end well. Our closing hymn, I think, is uh, 370. 370, if you're using the hymn book, Christ for the World We Sing. stand as we sing this hymn together. Thank you. 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you came to this world to seek and to save that which was lost. We acknowledge today that we were lost and without you there would have been no opportunity of an entrance into your kingdom. We thank you for your grace, your mercy, for the encouragement that comes to us by the <coughs> indwelling of the Spirit. And we thank you for the <coughs> possibilities that reside in each one of us because we have committed ourselves to you. Dismiss us again today, we pray, with the assurance that our salvation uh, is to be found in Jesus and in him alone. And we put our trust in him and we will take the road to your kingdom and be safely taken safely home. We thank you and praise you and we pray it please in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>